Welcome to Bitcoin Fixes This, where we explore the impact that Bitcoin will have in all aspects of society. Today's guest is a way slice, Bitcoiner, chef, and proprietor of the Beefsteak Dinners. We talk about food, its cultural impact, and its relational significance. We also talked a good deal about various diets like keto, vegetarianism, and carnivory. Finally, we talked a good deal about how low time preference behavior from Bitcoiners affects their food choices. Away Slice is an interesting person who has a deep passion for food. He's been a chef and caterer for a long time and really knows his stuff when it comes to food. I was really impressed with just how much he's deeply thought about the impact of food and what it means culturally. I hope you enjoy this interview. Away Slice, how's everything going? It's going good, man. Thank you for having me on. Yeah. Where are you these days? I'm actually, it's my kid's spring break, so I'm hanging out at my parents' house. You know, I normally live in Brooklyn, but we're, we're out in the country right now. It's been pretty nice to get away from the city for a second. I'm looking out oh, at a nice. lake and a bunch of trees right now. Yeah. How's that different from what's going on in New York? I've heard like so many horror stories of what New York's like. I find New York to be pretty, it's full of people that get along as long as you don't impede on them, right? Like I feel like it, mm. people are pretty cooperative and, and helpful towards each other. But because there's so many people, you're always reminded that COVID is in full swing there. Like some people mm. are freaking out about it. Everybody's always wearing masks. Like I'm out in the country. I don't see people ever and I'm not wearing a mask out here. And so I'm not reminded of COVID. Like I'm looking out, just at this beautiful scenery right now, and nothing I see reminds me of COVID. Whereas if I'm sitting at home in Brooklyn and I look out my window, everything I see reminds me of COVID. I feel like it's the main <laughs> difference is psychological. That's interesting. You have this visceral association with COVID and like sort of man made things, whereas like looking upon nature, you, I don't know, it sounds like you feel freedom there. Yeah, it's refreshing for sure. Yeah, freedom is a good way to put it. Mm -hmm. that's what well that's how how texans would describe it (laughs) yes yes it is and definitely like texas versus new york it's very different so you've obviously been doing a lot with cooking and you know steaks and for a lot of people with this beef steak dinner can you describe like what it is and how you came to be doing that yeah i was reading a i've been a chef my entire life in the most recent years i've been kind of doing working for private clients and have like a small catering event company and kind of have reduced my workload a lot. And I was reading this collection of historical food pieces from the New Yorker of all places. And there was just an article I came across. I think it's called all you can hold for five bucks. Mm. And it's this, the story of this guy going to all these beefsteak events in New York city and kind of talking about how they used to be so great and they're not great anymore. And they kind of started, it's a historic event specific to New York City, and they kind of started in basements of buildings, and they were all these kind of like blue-collar workers would just go to the basement and just eat all the steak and drink all the beer they could. And that's the event. Like the, A beefsteak is all you can consume, steak and beer, with no utensils or napkins. And then you get an, you get an apron, you can wipe your hands on the apron. But other than that, it's this kind of like engaging event where you have to use your hands and be present. And it kind of forces you to engage people and food and the event and the experience, which I think makes you remember it more. You know, like there's no one kind of at the table looking at their phone because their hands are too dirty. <laughs> but, but anyways, going back to that article, I read that article and I was like, I really want to do this. And I looked into it at the time. and turned out there were a couple of people doing them and I went to them and I felt that they were kind of terrible. And I was like, I think I can do this better than they were doing it. And so I wanted, started to do beef steaks and I had a couple in my backyard just for random strangers. And then there's a museum of food and drink in New York city called MoFat. And we did one there and it was like a total disaster because mm-hmm. I farmed out the, the cooking of steaks to this other chef and that was like part of the condition of me doing it there. And and he didn't get as much beef as I asked him to get. And we ran out of steak in like 20 minutes. And it was like, mm. I still wake up at night sweating 
thinking about that <laughs> night. It was it was terrible because the whole thing, like you sell it, it's all you can consume, steak and beer. And we ran out of steak really fast. Mm. And so I vowed to never let that happen again. <laughs> it was mm. a hard lesson. Mm. But then I went to a steak dinner with Pierre at the Brazilian steakhouse or something. And I just pitched it to him. I was like, I do these dinners called beef steaks. And I feel like there's like, you know, if you drew the Venn diagram of all you can eat steak and Bitcoiners, like there's a lot of overlap. So Pierre helped me do a Bitcoin one in my backyard in Brooklyn. And that was the first one. And since then, CK came to that one. No, no, CK didn't come to that one. I met CK at a dinner after we planned that one. And CK offered to do one in San Francisco. So we did one in San Francisco and the ball's kind of like been rolling since then. Mm. Yeah, it's certainly very interesting. I found what you just said super interesting because you do have this relationship between food and interaction and how people use it to connect with each other. And, you know, you mentioned that your hands are essentially too dirty to, you know, essentially look at your smartphone, all of these things that take us away from sort of being present and, you know, connecting with people. What is it about food that helps people connect? And, you know, perhaps you can talk about like your experience as a chef as well. Like what's special about that meal time for you that you, I, I don't know, it almost seems like something that you really value and some, something that kind of drives you a little bit. Yeah. Sort of unrelated is this thing that happens with a lot of people that have COVID, even if they don't have symptoms of COVID, or even if they're asymptomatic and they come out okay, a lot of people are losing their sense of smell. And I've been paying attention because it's that's very much a food thing. I've been paying attention to what happens with that. And psychologically, there's like a lot of implications of losing your sense of smell. And one of them is that you it becomes much harder to create memory pathways in the brain because we do that with smell. Mm. And that's kind of like a depressing thought to like have your ability to make memories be hindered. But I think on the other side of that is like the answer to your question or at the opposite end of that spectrum is like, I think that what really draws me to food is, is sharing. And because it is this, thing where we smell and taste and interact, you create memory. So I I like the idea of creating a pleasurable memory with other people, which I think the beef steak does. Like, even if it's not like the best steak in the world, just kind of like having music going, being interacting, smelling a fire and hearing steak sizzle and smelling steak charring you know, and then getting to eat it, it's, it's kind of this like whole orchestration of making a memory, which is a really special thing to do with a person. Like you never know when you're going to make a memory, right? Like mm. you just, you turn around and you have one. But I, I think, and then the other part of it is if you go to a really fancy restaurant and everyone gets your plates, gets their own plate of food and no one ever shares people are much less likely to remember those meals as opposed to say going to like a big restaurant in Chinatown where you sit in a circle and they have like a lazy Susan and they put a bunch of food and everybody's sharing those plates in the middle. People are much more inclined to be able to remember both what they ate, you know, whether or not they liked it and also just remember the meal, the conversation and the place. Whereas if you go to that fancy restaurant per se and you pay a thousand dollars a person, when you walk out of there, if you went to the person a week later and said, can you make notes about what you ate? Chances are they would not be very specific. You know, mm. they might remember aspects or they might remember certain aspects of certain plates, but kind of being able to walk through all the courses and describe what they had would fall flat. That's really interesting that you link food and sharing with memory and and, you know, I mean, this is obviously something I try to do with my family is to create memories for them. And, you know, your analysis is really, like, different than what you would normally think of as good memories. There's something about sharing. There's something about even, like, smelling things and having sort of like a visceral physical experience that helps you remember that moment. Is there something emotional about food that helps you get 
to these places where you can remember things? I don't know. Is there something emotional about food? I wouldn't say... I would say a couple of things. I don't know if this is really answering your question, but I would say like if I have like a day where I'm feeling down or a day where I'm feeling like, uh, yeah, I guess just down, like slightly depressed. Mm. A lot of things that I will, the thing that I will do to feel better or like the thing that I consider a treat to myself is trying to find a food that I've never had and going to eat it. And, you know, it could be like a crazy tofu in Chinatown or it could be, you know, Nepalese dumplings or Uzbek soup or something like that. And in New York, it's kind of fun. Like it's a good challenge. Like you can track it down and just go eat it. And it's, and I always feel better for having done that. I feel like I broadened my horizon. Like I wouldn't say that I'm an emotional eater where like some people are, like I don't suffer from like, I don't want to call it a disorder, but you know what I mean? Like I don't straight up eat to feel better, but, but eating good food does make me feel good. And then to take that one step further, I also think, you know, being able to cook or being able to make good food or find good food is a great thing to be able to share with people, right? So it's often how I'm generous, you know, like I like to make good food for people, which is another reason I like to do the beefsteak. Like, I think it's a fun thing to share with people, the spectacle of it. But I would think, I would say, I don't know, does that answer your question? I think so. It sounds like you kind of became a chef because you you enjoy this part of life, and it's something that obviously affects people. Is that accurate, or am I off base here? Yeah, no, I, I think you're right, and I, you know, it also it affects people, but it doesn't affect everyone. You know, like it self selects for people that like food, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, because because not everybody does. Not everybody. Like I like sitting around a table and having a casual meal and chatting and drinking wine. And like, I, I can do that for hours. Not everybody likes that. And I understand that. I think I'm fine with that. And I don't always like that. I said, I was going to ask you some questions about the carnivore <laughs> diet. One thing about the carnivore diet is that it leads, I don't know. It feels like it forces simple meals, right? Like, mm. do you put sauces on your steak? Do you put spices on your steak? Is it, do you put salt on your steak? Um, yeah, I, lately it's just been salt. For Lent, I basically just ate steak once a day. After doing my podcast with Sean Baker, I was like, okay, well, let me try this for a little bit. And I got to tell you, I felt fantastic. I ate like three and a half pounds of meat just like once a day. I wouldn't feel hungry the rest of the day or the next day. And then I would just do it again every day. It was really good. And you're right, it does kind of cause like very simple meals, though. Yeah. How is that different from what you were doing before? Like, were you, would you eat steak several times a day? or? Yeah, I was eating it like once or twice a day, and I wasn't eating nearly the quantity at once. I also had like eggs in there, and before that, cheese and things like that to make it a little more complicated. I was using hot sauces and, and things of that nature to make it more tasty. But, you know, like... To some degree, I think I, like, I don't know, you would know this better than me. I feel like I'm missing out on the flavor of the meat if I sauce it. And in a sense, like, my palate's gotten worse as a result of all of the, I don't know, the years of sriracha that uh, sauce that I've used and things like that. Like, what's your opinion on that? Are, are people's palates a little too, I don't know, coarse and not fine and sophisticated as a result of what they've yeah. eaten. I also think it, it's just the nature uh, of, I think yes, but I think more so it's just the nature of the meals we eat. You know, like I think about this when I do dinners for people, for clients, some people just want to go over the top. Like they want to put 20 things on the table, right? Mm. If I put 20 really delicious things on the table, mm. people put 20 things on their plate, right? And then they don't appreciate any one of them for what they are, <laughs> you know, like it kind of just mm. becomes this like parade of it's like the difference between like listening to an orchestra and listening to a three piece band, you know, like when you listen to an orchestra, you never think, wow, that is a really great violinist and that guy can really play the oboe. Whereas if you're listening to a three piece band, you kind of get a better, 
you can get a better like feel for what each of those musicians is doing. And I think you're right. It's like you mix all these things together and then you don't appreciate any one of those things. And then some things go together really well, you know, and some things don't. But it is nice to just have steak. I am totally just a salt and pepper guy when I eat steak. And very occasionally I will drizzle olive oil on there because I spent a long time working in Italy. And that's just our that's what they would do. Drizzle olive oil and occasionally squeeze lemon on top of it, which sounds kind of like a crazy thing, like lemon and olive oil on steak. But it, it is really good. So when we do beef steaks, it actually is kind of phases of steak over the course of the evening. And like I usually do a simple steak at first and then there'll be kind of like a more interesting steak, maybe like a spice steak or some kind of sauce to dip it in or sauce on top of it. And then the beef steak itself kind of becomes like a journey of different steakiness. And it always kind of ends with ribeyes mm. for dessert. Mm-mm. So there's probably different flavors of steak and you're sort of, as part of that experience, you're helping people like understand their palate and understand different tastes and sort of find enjoyment in each piece instead of having 20 things and not really appreciating any one of them. Yeah, ideally. (laughs) (laughs) Ideally. Um, Mm. It doesn't always come out that way, but. But that's sort of the goal, yeah. Mm. But also to keep it well, interesting. It, yeah, yeah, to actually make people understand what they're eating and so on. It kind of reminds me of like art or something like that where you can have just like way too much in a piece of art. Oftentimes that's not that good if too much is happening. But like a simpler picture, like I know this from just like taking lots of photos and things like that, and by no means a professional or anything. But if you have too much going on in a photo, it's it doesn't work. But if you can sort of isolate a subject, like you can gain a greater appreciation for whatever it is that you're photographing. And taste, it occurs to me, is very much like that. It's kind of like art where you don't want too much and you want some focus to your food yeah totally there's an interesting like photography challenge that i heard about where basically and i was talking my brother does photography and and i was talking to him about it because and i feel like today you can just you go out with a dslr and you can take 500 pictures and then like the job of photography ends up really just to be to sift through those photographs and find the good ones. Right. And then, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. so the challenge is go out for a day of photography, but you're only allowed to take 10 pictures and try to capture a good one. And it just kind of like forces you to think about taking the picture, right? Cause the people used to do it on film and they would run out of film and they would, you know, have to be a lot more selective with the pictures they were taking. I think it's an interesting process to kind of, force yourself to pair back, which is why I also think it could be like, I'm fascinated by how you felt, I guess now that Lent is over, like, did Mm. you put hot sauce on your steak today? (laughs) Or or, or, (laughs) like, did you enjoy the simplicity of just eating steak and salt for the, for Lent? Or were you ready for it to be over? I actually really enjoyed it. I like, here's the thing. Like I only had steak and salt And, you know, I use tallow for my oil even, so it's really just more steak or cow or whatever. And the thing is, like, I started being able to taste the difference between grass-fed and grain-fed meat. And I discovered I preferred the grass-fed, like, by a lot. There's, like, a flavor to it that I didn't notice before that, like, when I put even pepper on there, that I was just kind of like, oh, man, this tastes really good. I want to get more of it. And... Now I'm paying like double the price to get grass-fed meat because I like it so much. So I don't know. Did my palate change or what is it? Like what's going on there? I don't know. You know, who knows? I always like half joke that the carnivore diet is just a really good elimination diet. (laughs) It definitely is. Yeah. I think that it's like, it could be that if you were eating cheese, it's messing with your sinuses. Maybe you're which it would affect how you smell and get aromas from the the beef that you're eating. Mm. You know, that's just me speculating. Who knows? Mm. Maybe your mm. palate cleans up. 
you're eating less during the day, you know, are you a coffee drinker? Do you drink tea or anything like that? No, I, at least during Lent, I just drank water, not even like flavored sparkling water. I just drank straight water. And when, here's my other question. (laughs) When you sit down to eat your beef one time a day, like, are you hungry by the time you sit down to eat? Yeah, I'm hungry, but not like I used to, you know, like there's a hunger that's like very deep where you just need to eat. Like it's almost like an addiction, which, you know, I think before getting into carnivory, that was pretty common. And especially like when I was eating carbs, like it just comes up every few hours with this meat. It's a hunger. It's more like, you know, I could eat right now rather than I need to, like, I'm going to kill somebody if I don't get some food in me right yeah. now. Like, that, yeah, those are very different things. It's less of like a blood sugar thing. Mm. Like, it's mm-hmm. like, like hangry. <laughs> 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 I ask, because I also believe that like hunger is the best sauce, right? Like, mm. it's like, uh, if I have to give my kids food that I know that they're going to have trouble eating, which really is just, you know, vegetables. <laughs> Like having having them have salad or trying to encourage them to have a more diverse diet. I know I have to do it when they're hungry because then they'll mm. they'll like it. They'll eat it and they're more inclined to like it. And so they're more inclined to re-eat it later on down the line. Mm. So, but uh, do you have kids? I do. I, I have six of them. <laughs> wow. So you're right up there with the Bitcoin rabbi. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I am. I am. And Luke Dash Jr. and some and, and yeah. Adam back too. Yeah. So do you do other people in your household do the carnivore diet? Are you flying solo? Not really. Solo? Not really. I'm I'm more or less flying solo. Although, you know, everybody enjoys steak. That's the one thing that everyone will eat, you know, which I find interesting. Like there's gotta be something very nutritious about it if or like no one like sort of rejects meat per se. You know, what, why is yeah, that? What, what's going on? I, I'm with you. <laughs> I'm with you. It, it's delicious. I have the same thing. And when you have that that thing that everyone will eat, it's bound to turn up a lot more in your rotation, right? Of mm-hmm. what you're what you're cooking. Mm-hmm. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I, like that's what we ate for Easter yesterday. <laughs> we went to a steakhouse, and we all had like steak i don't think i ate enough because you know i was used to eating like three and a half pounds and they gave me like one and a half and i'm like oh man i'm still hungry but yeah like that yeah go ahead is it hard for you to get down three and a half pounds of beef that just sounds like a lot to me it does sound like a lot but if you're only eating once a day and this was something that sean told me is you know you can actually down quite a bit and this is something that our ancestors probably did He was telling me about like how he interviewed Molly Schuyler for his podcast. She's this like food eating champion, but she's like 140 pounds. Like, and she can down like three 72 ounce steaks in like 15 minutes or something ridiculous. And he's like, you know, like we have the capacity to do stuff like that. And then, you know, probably not eat for like four days. Uh, It's just that our bodies are not used to doing that. Instead, they're. You know, like he was saying, like, there are all these biological pathways for you to, like, just keep the food in your stomach and digest it a little bit at a time. So you continuously get energy. But, you know, we don't really use it because we're we just eat like every few hours. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. I should try it sometime. Everyone that I know that has ever done what you are describing has said Mm. nothing but good things. Mm. Well, how do you feel as a chef about the carnivore diet, though? Like, it's got to be like, I don't know, like you studied for years to learn how to make all this stuff. And, you know, you're kind of throwing away a lot of it in a carnivore diet. Yeah, I, I mean, I first of all, if to each their own, if someone wants to do it or if it makes them feel good, I think they should absolutely do it. I do think that there's kind of this I, I feel like the ketogenic diet, right, is like the stepping stone diet to to carnivory, right? But I feel like a lot of people mess up the ketogenic diet and they never really get into ketosis. And as a result, what they're doing is they're not, they're consuming too many carbs to actually be in ketosis, in which case they're just consuming a bunch of fat and it's not working well for them. Maybe it's even potentially dangerous, but that's basically like the American diet, right? Like it's just carbs and lots of fat or lots of carbs and lots of fat. And we know the result of that. But in terms of like how I feel about it as a chef, 
I don't know. I, I you know, I, I just people eat what they eat, and I I cook what I cook. You know, it's like if people want to cook what I'm cooking, that's fine. And and if mm-hmm. a carnivore comes over for dinner, like I'm happy to make a bunch of meat. Also, like I, I like that. I don't. I think if I was the thought of doing it myself, I would I would do it to try it. Mm-hmm. But I think that I would eventually really start to have that nagging feeling of wanting variety. Cause I feel mm. like that's like, for me, that is like variety of diet is what keeps me going. Like I look forward to the seasons. I look forward to different fruits and vegetables throughout the year. Mm. I like try to grow a garden and we have fruit trees in our backyard in Brooklyn. And I like the variation that, that cycles of food bring. Mm. And I would miss that if I was just eating meat. Um, yeah, that's a surprisingly a common kind of fear for a lot of people getting into carnivory is they're afraid that they're going to have palate fatigue and that they're just going to get sick of whatever they're eating. But yeah. I don't know, for me, like, I haven't had that. And, you know, I enjoyed food before. Like, I've gone to Michelin star restaurants and stuff. And, you know, I've eaten there. And, you know, I perfectly like the food that I was served. But it's different than, I don't know, in a sense, like, I just feel really good after I eat this stuff. And it's not like I'm torturing myself eating something delicious like a ribeye steak. It, it just yeah, totally. it, it doesn't feel like a deprivation to me, which, which yeah. for a lot of people, it seems like, you know, or that's what they imagine it to be. I mean, is that what you're thinking? No, I, I guess I just think that, I mean, I, first of all, I would say I am with you 100%. Like, I... Like mm-hmm. switching in and out of intermittent fasting. When I first started doing that back in the day, you know, like I was like, am I going to miss breakfast? Like I like breakfast. And then mm-hmm. you kind of like, there is, after you kick breakfast, you're like, oh, breakfast, it's kind of a pain in the butt. Like, you know, like you got to buy all the food, you got to cook it somehow. Then you got to clean up afterwards. Like, and you cut out a meal, you're like, you cut out a lot of steps from your day and it's like, it frees you up a little bit. And I'm, and I imagine that there's a, an aspect of that that happens when you are only eating steak, you know, it's like, you're not pegged with all these decisions of like, what interesting meal am I going to make for dinner? You know, like the decision is like, what steak, what cut am I going to eat? <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and that is refreshing. And I like, I love for things to be simple. But I'll, like I said, I'm motivated by variety. Like I'm motivated to try different cultures and different cuisines. And it's something that I look forward to. And it's also something that I like sharing with my family. Like I like we go to new restaurants and try new foods together. Mm. And like you said, like that's like we said at the beginning, that's us creating memories. You know, like it doesn't always go well. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but it's the effort, you know, like we're like put it in. We're putting in the time to try those things out. I think that's what I would miss. That is, you make a good point there about like sort of, you know, food is sort of like a very important part of the human experience for a lot of people. And, you know, I noticed this strangely enough when I travel because, you know, I did backpack for like three months and stuff. And basically this was back when I was vegetarian, by the way, I used to be a vegetarian. So all I ate on the road were like was like Nutella, bread, and I think cheese. I think that <laughs> that was all I ate. And people would ask me while I was backpacking, like, Jimmy, what are you eating? Like, because, you know, for them, travel is about food, right? Like, it's the things that you get to experience. And that that's, for them, what was the big uh, sort of interesting thing that you would get out of it. And for me, it was more about like, you know, meeting new people and seeing new places and, you know, learning about myself because I was traveling alone. But, you know, for a lot of other people, they couldn't understand that because for them, it was just sort of like, you know, I why aren't you going and, you know, experiencing this wonderful food and so on, which to be fair, I did have some of those experiences while I was there, but it was, I don't know, it, it seems more central to other people. Yeah. I mean, it is a form of hedonism, right? Like it is a mm. form of like, Going back to what we were saying earlier, the more you overdo it, the less you appreciate. Um, mm. I, so it's interesting that you say you're a vegetarian. I actually was. So I grew up in Missouri, and there is a beef farm in my family. So I had tons of beef growing up as a kid. And then in high school, I became a vegan for a while. And that was actually what started me cooking, because my mom was sort of like, look, 
you can be a vegan, but I'm not cooking for you. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so I started getting into cooking and, and that was actually kind of what brought me like kind of full circle back into eating meat and eating weird meats and not wasting the animal mm. and learning to cook. And now I kind of am, am where I am today. You said you were backpacking. Where were you backpacking? Oh, it was Europe. I was in my 20s and, you know, nice. I went for like three months. And, you know, that was probably one of the more formative experiences in my life. And yeah. Yeah. It's something, it's so unique to, to be alone like that. Like, not like you're alone, but like you really are just with yourself during that time, mm. right? At least for parts of it. Um. Mm. When I was young, I had this experience where I was kind of going to kind of either I was studying art in school and I was going to either go back to school to study art because I had a scholarship to do that or I was going to go cook. And I got a job in Italy and I ended up going to Italy to cook and I lived in Italy for a while and cooked there. And I just remember when I first got there, I spent some time kind of like I, I would call it backpacking, but I wasn't really backpacking. But it's so you get to those other countries and there's you don't speak the language <laughs> and you're kind of just it, you're isolated with your thoughts. And, and I feel like that changes a person and not everybody goes through that in, in life. Yeah, um, very few people do. And that was so valuable, at least for me. I feel like I found out about myself stuff that I didn't know. I don't know how it was for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I feel like at this, like at my later stage in life, I'm now 40 ish. Mm. I feel like it's, you can tell those, I can see those people that have, like, I have a couple of friends that I know did it and a couple of friends that I know didn't do it. And I don't always come back to this, but I think about it sometimes. I think about how it kind of, it is a formulative moment in a person's life doing something like that. Mm. And bringing it back to food, because in a sense, what motivated you to go do this Italy thing was because of your love of food, correct? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it was such a great experience. I mean, I, it was sort of like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> my dad would say shit or get off the pot. Like it was sort of like mm -hmm. that moment. It was like time to kind of like pick something. And I wanted to, I wanted to be sure I knew that I could always go back to college, but I would not get other opportunities to work in Italy. So I wanted to be sure that it was something that I wanted to do. I guess, I, how would I say that? I wanted to be sure that it, I didn't want to pass up that opportunity. Like I, I could try it. And if I didn't like it, I could go back to college. Um, but if I didn't try it, I would never get that opportunity again. So I, I just got in and then I never looked back. It was all just downhill from there. And that was sort of like, a great cooking education. You can go over there, you can work in restaurants. A lot of high-end restaurants have places you can live and obviously they feed you. <laughs> so I really, all my cooking education was free. I came back and I could speak Italian and I had like $800 in credit card debt from the years that I was there. And it was just like, it was pretty sweet. Like that was my student debt really. And, and I came back and hit the ground running. And it's sort of like a, it's such like a unique career. It's really about rep just cooking in restaurants. It's really about repetition. You know, like it's about like showing up every day and it's almost like weightlifting, right? Like you just like show up every day and you, <laughs> you try to do a little bit better. Hmm. But if you fail, like what you do, you just, you put it down and, and you come back again and you try it again and you succeed or you don't. And then you, you kind of keep moving forward. Hmm. So I don't know. Do you like, cooking steaks that's the other part that's i do now of, yeah that's the other part of eating interesting things is like i like cooking interesting things also i like going to interesting markets i like getting spices i like like trying different techniques of things and that's also super stimulating for me and that's something i try to force on myself so it is very interesting that you put it that way because in a sense for you food or exploring food is almost like traveling to another country right like where Absolutely. you're getting to know the culture or something and in a sense like 
for most people, that's the level of cultural exposure that you get to the other culture is their food, right? Like yeah. you might not speak Mandarin or have been to China or whatever, but you've probably eaten Chinese food. Although, you know, American Chinese food is probably very different than what's actually in China and so on. But that's the level of, in a sense, like food is the one thing that kind of is very easy to access uh, from another culture. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. And I feel like sometimes I feel like I pit like authenticity. It's almost like diversity and authenticity can kind of work against each other. Like in New York, there's mm -hmm. just a ton of diversity. And like you gave the example of the Chinese restaurant because of that, you're a little bit less likely to get super authentic Chinese food, but you can still, obviously in New York, you can still get pretty authentic Chinese food. But, and it's like that, like, say you're in China, obviously you're going to get authentic Chinese food in China, but then you go get a pizza and it's never the pizza you want. You know, it's always like, pizza. <laughs> it's always like pizza in China a little bit. I'm using mm -hmm. China. I have not spent any time in China, but I've spent time in Thailand and I feel that way about pizza in thailand <laughs> <laughs> it's just like or a hamburger or something like that it's always like a thai version of the thing you want mm -hmm. there, you know? there's sort of like a twist to all of these that all, all of these cuisines essentially become some sort of fusion cuisine even if they're supposedly from another country in other words yeah and even uh, even the things we're calling authentic were probably at one point viewed as not such right like food is always constantly changing. Like my grandma's grandma might not have liked what she made, but I consider what my grandma made to be authentic. <laughs> and then I make stuff that I'm sure my grandma would frown upon, <laughs> but my grandkids will think is authentic. So, you know, we're just passing the baton. Mm. Yeah. So to bring this back to Bitcoin a little bit, like, do you see like food changing as a result of people having sort of a lower time preference? Because I do see sort of like the high time preference behavior most obviously with food because people will eat what just tastes good to them and not necessarily what's good for them or what their body needs. Like, how do you see that as a chef? Oh, it's a good question. I mean, it's definitely like the world of like fast food and sugar and corn syrup. It is painful. It is painfully damaging, right? And obviously people pay the price and we all pay the price. Like even if we're not the ones getting sick, you know, takes a crazy toll on people. For me, it would be that that transition would have happened the other way. Like, I think that I already had a, a lower time preference when it came to food in terms of like waiting for ingredients and doing cooking processes that take forever. Mm. And so that aspect of Bitcoin would have made more sense to me off the bat for that reason. Mm. And, but I do wonder if it has that effect on people going the other direction like it kind of yeah. slows people's time preferences down and then they start applying that to other places in their life, including food. Mm. I do have like these, like I have mixed feelings about how to draw. Actually, I, I would kind of like your feedback on this, especially in terms mm. of the carnivore diet. I, I, I sometimes think about like, you know, food is in the end, it's us putting energy in the form of calories into our body. Right. And I feel like sometimes you could make the argument that carnivory is like faster calories. In other words, meat calories are a poorer store of energy value than something like processed wheat or like we can put processed wheat, we can put calories in processed wheat into a jar and put it in the cabinet for three years, right? And then take it out mm. and then eat it and use that energy. Whereas meat won't hold on to those energy calories quite uh, as well. Unless it's that make, uh, that, pemmican. That, you can store pemmican for like 50 years. So, and that's <laughs> all meat. So I don't know. I think it's more dependent yeah, on, yeah. 
on the processing, but I've heard that argument, but like, and you know, to be fair, I used to be vegetarian and this, the stuff sort of stuff that I used to say too. And but, I mean, that's not uh, like a hill I'm going to die on or anything. I, it's yeah. just something I, it's just like me playing devil's advocate and wondering what mm. people think about it. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. I, do you, I, do I just, you, go ahead. Do you feel like Bitcoin has changed how you think about food? I think so. I'm certainly thinking much more long term about it and I'm questioning everything. And that's definitely one of the reasons why I started looking into carnivory. It was, okay, all these people are dismissing it, but they also dismiss Bitcoin. So what else am I wrong about? And, you know, looking into it and actually looking at the evidence and, you know, seeing how the body works and, you know, following people like Sean Baker, it's definitely changed how I think about food and, you know, what my body actually needs. Like, you know, hunger signals are probably your body telling you I need nutrition, not necessarily, you know, the flour that's been sitting in your cabinet for three years. It's very, you know, I think I have a better understanding of my body and what I need than I did before, if that makes sense. And that's definitely an effect of Bitcoin. Have you noticed any health benefits from your time doing carnivory, like oh, definitely. Of mind or yeah. So I'm less like up and down in terms of energy. Like yeah, you know, I think that's definitely one. I can think a lot clearer. So you know, the rest of my life when I was like say vegetarian, like feels kind of like a fog, whereas now it feels like I'm, you know, like I'm awake, fully awake, or something to that effect. Mm-hmm. Definitely like seeing better gains um, lifting. So I took up powerlifting around the same time and I've gotten a lot stronger. My body composition's definitely changed. And yeah, like just in general, I'm, I'm able to stick to things a little bit better. I don't know if that's because I'm getting older or if I'm just, if like the meat is helping me or something, but that's definitely a change as well. So yeah, I mean, it's hard to know what caused what, yeah. but I'm just sort of listing a bunch of things that are correlated with my carnivory. Totally. There's, how long have you been doing it in the weightlifting? Weightlifting, I started, so I stopped being vegetarian, I think, eight years ago. And that was when I went to paleo. And a few months after that is when I started weightlifting. And, you know, like I just did the powerlifting, squats, and bench press, and overhead press, basically. And I, I've kept up with that for the last eight years. And, you know, while I was paleo, I was doing a certain amount. And then I switched to keto, like, a few years after that, and I got a little stronger. I got really thick, too. I just looked really big. Like, my neck was really... Yeah, I was going to say, the, necks and, the neck and traps really start, like, coming out. <laughs> Yeah. And I kind of look like a meathead a little bit. I switched to carnivory soon after that. And I thinned, actually, like a lot of... um, So I got skinnier. So I think at my height as a on keto, I was like 200, 205, something like that. And I was doing some of these lifts. Since then, I'm right now like 180, 185, somewhere around there. So I've lost like 15, 20 pounds. And I can lift more than I was doing then. And I don't look as much like a meathead. I think I like my body better, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Yeah. Uh, Then, yeah, even though, like, I look stronger back then, like, I'm actually stronger now. Yeah, I have, like, I do very similar workout routine of just kind of like the five exercises. I find when I, and I, and throughout the course of the year, I will cycle in and out of ketosis but none. Mm. And I always find it when I'm in ketosis, it just takes the wind out of my sails. I, everything gets knocked back like 10 or 15%. I never quite have the same. I wonder if I just need to push through, <laughs> go straight carnivore and, and like see how, how it works for three months or something like that. Yeah. I think there's probably something to what you said earlier about the elimination thing. Cause You know, I I don't know what foods I'm sensitive to. And I imagine that I was probably eating some of those. And it was, it's probably causing me to, causing some sort of inflammation somewhere in the body and, you know, retaining more water and things like that probably caused my weight to gain a little bit more and things. But I, I, I like, yeah, there's something about like just 
going with this pure meat diet that helps sort of figure things out. I don't know. You're kind of, t- I feel like you're talking me into it. It sounds pretty good. <laughs> the other thing I think about is, and I definitely experience this with, with the keto diet is like you said, kind of, you have less energy swings. Um, mm. And I find that that makes me a much better parent. Mm. <laughs> makes me more patient and yeah, more patient. It makes me more patient. I'm less inclined to react to things or, not want to deal with something because I'm tired at the moment or foggy or kind of like feeling overwhelmed. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the one thing that I've definitely noticed is less anxiety. Like I'm just much calmer in general. And that could be because I'm getting older or something and I have more life experience or something like that. I definitely feel like there's something to that. So I also rock climb, and this is something that no, that's great. You know, a lot of people do. So I have an indoor gym that I go to, or whatever. But a lot of people use a lot of chalk because their hands get sweaty as they start climbing up, right? Like mm-hmm. they, there's like a physical reaction to like a scary move or something. I almost never use chalk because my hands don't get sweaty. <laughs> like it, I'm just sort of like, okay, well, if I fall, if I, I fall, right? Like it's, I don't get that like. I mean, once in a while, I'll get it if it's like a really scary move, right? Like something I've never done before. I might hurt myself or something like that. But yeah. vast majority of the time, it's just sort of like, you know, like, you know, it, it is what it is and I'll try it and, you know, that's it. That's so crazy. So do you go around and do like crazy, crazy climbs, like travel around and do rock climbing? Uh, I mean, I have too big a family to go do stuff yeah. like that. But if I were, you know, maybe later in life, I, that's something that I can do with my kids or something. But uh, for now, not not really. Yeah, I admire that. I'm kind of scared of heights. I love the idea of rock climbing, but not the idea of being high and dangling from a rope. <laughs> well, you um, just sort of have to train yourself, right? So I honestly wonder if, like, you probably have some fear of heights right now. How much of that anxiety is based on the food that you're eating? And if, like, going on a carnivore diet, like, maybe it wouldn't be so hard. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. I I don't know either. I don't know. If, I don't know if steak is eating only steak is going to solve my fear of heights. But maybe. But I I guess I won't know until I try. Yeah. But I think you're right. I think there is an aspect of just like the rock climbers that I've known have said that there's there's like a corner you turn where you just like one day you're just up there and like instead of feeling slightly fearful, you just feel totally liberated. And they all know that change of mentality when that happens. And they're kind of standing on a cliff. And for the first time, they're just not at all worried about falling. Maybe also they have a lot more, they develop like confidence in their equipment. <laughs> Whereas if they did <laughs> fall, they, they knew they were just going to fall eight feet and hit the rock or something like that. <laughs> but that's great. I admire that practice of rock climbing. It's, it's pretty awesome. Well, I, if you ever want to try it, like, uh, let me know. It's it, you know, like indoor climbing is like super safe and you got like harnesses and stuff. So it's, yeah, it's totally really not totally. that bad. Um, Let's go back to Bitcoin just a little bit again, because I do really feel like there's something here about low time preference behavior, maybe changing how people view food and like how maybe your industry is changing. I, obviously, you're doing this beefsteak stuff. Like, mm-hmm. and you're, you're seeing a lot of Bitcoiners come out to it. Do you find that they have a bigger appreciation for this sort of event than maybe other people? You know what I would say? I would say yes. It kind of, you know, that disc- I have that elevator pitch description of a beef steak that I did at the beginning, which is just that it, it's an all you can consume steak and beer dinner with no utensils or napkins. I have said that phrase so many times and you can see in a person's face immediately whether or not they like that idea. <laughs> Cause some people do, do not like it. Like they're just like, I don't think I could do that, mm. which is kind of what Bitcoin does. Like it kind of like self selects for people a little bit. Mm. Um, and then, mm. so I do feel that it appeals to Bitcoiners more than it appeals to normal people. <laughs> If I were just like take a poll at a grocery store or something like that, it seems to just click with with Bitcoiners. And I, you know, nothing against Bitcoiners or Bitcoin meetups, but it is like 
usually the BitDevs are a little bit better, but often just Bitcoin meetups, it, it has a tendency to be heavy in the white dude demographic, right? And I, <laughs> and that could be playing into what I'm saying right now, but I'm not sure. In terms of having low time preference, I don't know. What do you think about, well, first of all, what do you think when you hear that description of a beefsteak? Like, does that, I, you don't drink, do you? Or do you? I don't, I don't, I don't yeah. drink. So the but, beer part but is the not idea. No, no, it, it's not. And, and the only reason that I don't drink is because I realize like I can't do it in a way that's healthy for me. So I just like eliminate it altogether. And also I think it's like I, my body just doesn't like it. Like, you know, I tell the story of how Max and Stacy got me to quit drinking by like making me drink tequila, basically. But <laughs> but basically yeah. there's something that my body just doesn't like about alcohol and it's and i don't even have like the asian red face thing it's just my body doesn't like it so that's why but the idea of beefsteak is very attractive to me because i like eating a lot of it and i don't know it brings me back to something a little more primitive i suspect that like what you're sort of replicating with this beef te- beefsteak is probably what it was like after a kill of a giant like megafauna or something like that back in the day, right? Like you you kill a big animal and you just get together and eat as much of it as you can before it goes bad. Yeah. That's a great way to think about it. And I don't know, there's probably something that it's tapping into sort of like a more base or primitive part of myself that I haven't necessarily tapped into very much. And that's for me, what's kind of attractive about it. It's like, Let's not care about utensils or whatever, you know, you just, you know, rip into it with your hands and, you know, chew. And, you know, this is probably closer to, you know, the pre-industrial experience of, uh, you know, what food gathering was like than, you know, like kind of like what you described with uh, everyone taking away your plates, everyone getting individual things and things like that. Yeah. This seems more visceral. I don't know. Totally. I agree with everything you just said, but then, like you said, bring it back to Bitcoin. How do you thread that and low time preference and Bitcoin together? <laughs> it's kind of like, <laughs> I, at least one analogy that I can think of is that with Bitcoin, you're saving now so you can have more fun later, right? Like you can do things later. And that's kind of the way I want to eat too, right? Like just eat now and then you don't have to worry about it for a while. And that's, kind of like intermittent fasting, right? Like, and, you know, if you can do beefsteak really properly, I don't, and, you know, you really eat as much as you can, you probably don't have to eat for like two days afterwards. And that's, in a sense, sort of like saving now so you don't have to worry about it later and you can do other more interesting and productive things as necessary. Yeah, 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 that's true. Thank you for articulating that for me, Jimmy. (laughs) (laughs) So you're doing this beefsteak thing in Austin. Like, what does the prep look like? How do you like, how much meat do you have to buy? And how are you cooking it all in time and so on? So I, I, we're fortunate to have like be doing it at this place that has like a really cool and huge outdoor. I don't know. It might be covered. I don't know if it's outdoor, but it's at least open air grill. They have a giant fire pit too. I haven't yet proposed to them. I think I'm going to try to cook a bunch of meat over the fire put in addition to their grill, but I haven't talked to them about that yet. And I usually get, my goal is to have three pounds of edible meat per person. And that's always been enough. Some people really go to town on the beer and beer can be really filling, but there are some people like yourself that just roll in there and just eat a bunch of steak. And it's a good thing for that, right? Because they're just like varieties of cuts and it's getting cooked different ways. And maybe some pieces will be smoked and cooked for a long time. And some people, some of them will just be, you know, grilled really quickly over hot coals. So it's a lot of meat. (laughs) I mean, it ends up being like, (laughs) let's say there's 60 people coming right now. I'm trying to see if I can squeeze more people in. But that means basically I buy 200 pounds of meat and then Mm. I get a lot of it. Some of it will be smoked, some of it will be grilled ahead of time and reheated when people get there, and then some of it is just like being cooked while people are there eating. Mm. Um, but it's kind of a spectacle, you know, like it's like a, it looks a little bit like a meat museum when you show up because there's just meat hanging places and piles of meat stacked up and 
piles of sliced meat. It's kind of a fun thing to see. I get really excited. I mean, I am grateful to Pierre and CK for kind of like taking chances on me in the early days of doing these, which wasn't even that long ago. I mean, it's two or three years ago, but I just love doing, I just, there's nothing I love more than doing these steaks. It's just a lot of fun. I like like hanging out with Bitcoiners and grilling a ton of beef and just having everybody kind of like chilling out and enjoying themselves and hopefully making memories. It's like, it really is like something I just love doing. I, I'm so excited for the one in Austin and then we're going to do one in Miami as well. So oh, when's the one in Miami? It's going to be Wednesday, June 2nd. And I'm finalizing mm-hmm. the space right now. It's going to mm-hmm. be, if I get the space, it's going to be a little bit more of like a funky, funky beef steak. Mm-hmm. I feel like the one that's going to happen in Austin, is going to be pretty Texas. It's cool because they, they kind of, vary from place to place but it was it was hard to find in miami a place that was had the feel of a beefsteak because every place is either kind of like miami chic you know like mm. sleek art deco lines and or it's sort of like florida fancy kind of like i don't know how you should describe it like lots of like curly busy decorations and f- fancy chairs with big pillows and I don't know how to. Have you ever seen the, that documentary, The Queen of Versailles? It was like, a, uh, yeah, I have actually. Yeah, <laughs> been a like long time. Mm. It's like how you imagine their house, just kind of like mm. fancy stuff, but from everything's from Pier One. Mm. I, I don't know how to describe <laughs> it. So it's, it was hard to find a spot down there. Um, mm. Well, I'm definitely looking forward to my first beef steak next week. I, and by the time this comes out, I think it might have, will already have happened or is about to happen or something like that. So very, very excited. Where can people find you? I am Away Slice on Twitter and, and that's mm. that's where you find me. Okay, great. Uh, you don't, do you have a website or anything? I have BitcoinBeefSteak.com, but there's not a lot going on there right now. That's on. <laughs> <laughs> you should at least uh, provide a link to a beefsteak in Miami. That might be a good idea. Yeah, yeah. That's, Any, I'm I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks for coming on the show. This was, you know, I didn't quite expect it to go in this direction, but I think you've made the case that food is a deep cultural and emotional and relational part of our lives. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was a it was a pleasure chatting with you. Well, that wraps it up for this episode of Bitcoin Fixes This. Away Slice can be found at at Away Slice on Twitter and BitcoinBeefSteak.com. Until next time, fiat the lenda est.